some good things have happened. I think in Canada, specifically, the, the tax reform has been helpful. You talk to USVCs, they, they say, absolutely, uh, this, is, this has been an issue, and this is you know, a welcome relief. It doesn't solve everything, though. You know, R&D incentives, you know, Israel has been a very interesting model for the way that they, they, they fund R&D and they provide on the back end an opportunity to pay it back over time. It's reversed in Canada. It's, you know, you, you spend the money first and then you get it reimbursed. The problem is if you don't have the money, how do you spend it? So it, there's a, the kind of a, uh, a logic that's missing there in terms of you know, it's an environment where it's capital rich, that's great, it's a nice form of um, you know, non-dilutive capital, but in an environment where you need capital, there needs to be an easier way for entrepreneurs to get to that capital to, to promote um, uh, innovation. You know, we talked about the angels and incubators. I think it's very important. I think that a lot of the work that's being done is in that area. But again, that's, you can't stop there. You gotta keep that ecosystem going forward to, to foster entrepreneurship through Series A, through Series B, to, and putting them in touch with strategics and accessing different pools of capital. Um, you know, I think bureaucracy is a problem. You've got improper incentives for many of the people that are actually deploying the dollars, uh, you know, not just in, in Canada, but, but everywhere, is that these programs are set up without the proper incentives for success. And I think that's some, one area that, that can be looked at appropriately. And that also goes to how you allocate the, the percentage of assets into venture capital and private equity. Uh, and, and I think it's, you know, the, the collaboration and the, the different um, networks that are created for funds and entrepreneurs and strategics uh, in an environment is very important. If you look at the Silicon Valley, the reason it, was so, it is so successful is because it's a very small, closed, interconnected network. Everybody knows everyone else. Israel is a great example. It's very small. Uh, it's not closed, but it's very uh, collaborative in its approach. Uh, I think those kind of ecosystems are nece necessary to connect the right people and especially in an environment where we're accessing high net worth capital, corporate capital, um, uh, non-traditional venture and PE funds where you need that network to be strong uh, to, to access that capital. And you know, in the, it's, all, it's all about support. And I, I think one of the most interesting business models I heard recently was a, a firm that was reaching out to high net worth companies and angel funds and saying, listen, let me manage your portfolio. Uh, because you're not doing it. You're putting your money to work and you're just waiting. You're not adding any value to these companies. And, and that's really where the function of venture capitalists should come. And I think there's an opportunity to do that in such a way that uh, you can foster and promote with existing sources of capital uh, today and, and creating the right uh, support for companies going forward. Um, and, and then I, again, I t talked about the M&A side of it. But it's also the IPO world, is that you've got you know, the banks imploding, creating kind of the four major banks doing everything right now. Uh, you know, I, I came from the Roberts and Stevens world, and I worked you know, at Jefferies, which is very much you know, focused on the growth capital or the growth, emerging growth company and IPO. There is a market for companies to go public um, in the growth stage. And it needs to be fostered through the VCs, the private equity firms, the public investors, and, and companies to create that ecosystem. And it's a lot of people are trying, and I think those conversations are happening much more frequently, which is a very good thing. But it's, it's still a, a market where you're not going to invest in something if your only outlet is, a, is an M&A exit. You've got to have an IPO market to, that supports that. Um, so it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, negatives there. I think the positives are is that the, the environment is certainly improving. Uh, and this is an environment that is a very good time to invest. And so uh, promoting the asset class in general um, is, is a very important thing to do. And I think the asset class has changed in a lot of ways in the ways I mentioned. Uh, but it's, you know, social networking. And the deals Google's doing, you know, buying a company for $300 million, uh, slide in social, you know, social networking. You've got, uh, you know, still semiconductors getting bought. Wintegra, which is an Israeli company, got bought for $250 million last week. Uh, there are deals happening. You saw Playdom get acquired by Disney, which is a gaming site. These are big deals. These are nice returns for the venture capitalists. There is positive stories happening. And so, uh, and there's a lot of companies in need of capital that can go down that path as well. But again, it's, you know, capital efficiency and, and, and innovation supported by the right ecosystem are very important. So how do we help? So Landmark, uh, essentially, as I said, is, is a kind of confluence of three things. It's advisory, which we call venture development, which is uh, putting ourselves in the, in the place of the business development professionals at growing companies, getting them access through our network to Fortune 1000, uh, technology buyers, service buyers, software buyers, uh, and doing it on a big ticket uh, basis. Banking, I think we know what that is. It's capital raising, it's, it's M&A, and it's investment of our own capital into companies we believe in and want to have part of our portfolio and provide those services into. So um, from an industry standpoint, I think all germane to the you know, technology, life sciences and healthcare, business services and media, 
Um, I think all of that is very relevant to today's discussion, and uh, we are kind of throughout those, those areas. Um, if you think about how we interact, so you've got a set of CIOs, CTOs, uh, chief development officers, corporate officers uh, that are looking for ideas uh, and looking for trusted advisors. And we've been doing this for 15 years, and we have extensive relationships to help access those people. Uh, we have a very close relationship with the VC and private equity community who are also looking for deals. Uh, we're one of them, but we're also an advisor to them. And so we have interesting dynamics. We create forums for these two types of parties to interact uh, and do it on a very senior level basis to think about themes and, and opportunities. Uh, and, then, and then there's you know, essentially our clients, which are emerging technology companies, technology companies who need help. Uh, and some have very good traction. Some are large public companies looking to grow into you know, new, new emerging, emerging sectors through M&A. Uh, but we essentially put ourselves in a position of linking the United States, Canada, and Israel by tying all these people together. And, and hopefully some of you can come to our future events. We had two events last week in LA, one in media and technology, one in, on a philanthropy uh, uh, topic that really bring together the leaders in these areas. Um, I talked about this. I think it's a unique platform in how investment banking works with companies. And I, I want to stress that we're trying to change the model a little bit. And, and I come from an investment banking world where you know, there is the, the problem of minimum deal size and there's a problem with how you're, you're compensated. Uh, we're taking an approach to support companies over their life cycle uh, and to give them different uh, tools in, ter in terms of uh, how they grow, how they uh, develop their networks and channels, and how they access capital. Uh, and also to you know, provide merger and acquisition support to grow inorganically. Um, you know, why, do, why do investors and corporations care? Because uh, we do things, this, what we call technology access program, which is of creating forums where we put multiple companies in front of multiple buyers of technology and create these opportunities to share ideas, to create benchmarks, uh, to create a, a trusted channel of, for innovation so that they know what's on the front lines in a non-threatening way. We're not pushing. Um, too much in terms of what they buy, we're letting them make decisions and by building that trust, we provide access for those early stage companies to get into very important buyers. So, you know, sitting in New York where we were based, Citigroup, you know, uh, Credit Suisse, these are all buyer, huge buyers of technology uh, and there are so many companies trying to access them, this, we created a forum for them to do that. Um, you know, from the deal flow standpoint, this is, this is obvious, but, you know, for us seeing different sectors of Israel, Canada, and others, it's, it's non-mainstream. It's outside of the Silicon Valley. It's, uh, it's providing access to different types of entrepreneurs. Uh, and then also working with large public companies to buy companies, and I think that's a, an important channel in terms of exit uh, opportunities. Um, so uh, from the landmark perspective, I, I think we're trying to be different. We're trying to embrace growing companies. I'm thrilled to be here. I think there's a lot of great entrepreneurs in the room and investors that uh, have great ideas, and, and we're, we're here to kind of help that innovation. Uh, and we want to take this kind of approach of adding value over the, the full life cycle of the company, not just on a deal-by-deal -deal basis, and not just one round. So if we're going to invest in a company, we're going to bring capital to a company, it's going to be a long-term basis. Uh, and I'm you know, very, very keen, based on our presence in Tel Aviv, based on our presence uh, in the United States, and some of the deals we've done recently with Canada, to, to see this linkage uh, be even stronger. So with that, I'll take some questions. We will do it this way. If, are there any questions for John? I can wait. Uh, or maybe you'll wait for a few minutes. Sure. We'll listen to Michael, and then uh, we'll take questions for everybody. Um, our next speaker is uh, Michael Perry. Uh, Michael is, um, I was introduced to Michael Perry by my cousin Maury Blumenfeld in Israel. I didn't realize it, that Maury is a relation. His wife is a Grafstein, but uh, Michael has a, a double advantage. We're related on both sides. Both his mother and his father were cousins of mine. So, and I discovered this because uh, Maury introduced me to Michael, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons I've invited him to come here. But more important than that, uh, Michael is a very, very interesting, uh, um, has a very interesting background. He's, he, was, he came from Toronto. Um, he's a venture uh, partner in Bay City Capital and has been in the firm since 2005. And he serves as president and chief medical officer uh, Pontiard Pharmaceuticals, a Bay City capital portfolio. So his firm is in San Francisco, but he lives in Palo Alto. And he has 20 years of experience as uh, an executive in the pharma and biopharma industry, and has been materially involved in filing over 50 INDs and over 30 NDAs, BLAs across the globe. 
His previous roles include Chief Development Officer of Via Pharmaceuticals and a chief Founder and Chief Officer of Entropy Pharmaceuticals. He was a Chief Officer of uh, Farsight uh, and involved in a number of other countries, companies and is on a director of a number of boards. Um, in, the, in these positions, he was the Global Head of R&D for Baxter Biosciences. Uh, he was a Vice President of Novartis, a Vice President of Syntex. He cur currently serves as a member of the board of Targeted Genetics. Michael holds a, a non-news BS in physics from the University of Guelph and a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from the Ontario Veterinary College. And he told me a very interesting narrative last night at my house about how he got to be from a veterinarian to be an entrepreneurial venture capitalist, and it's a fabulous story. And he holds a PhD in biomedical pharmacology from the University of Guelph. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Veterinary and Surgeons and is also a graduate of the Executive International Management Program at Harvard. And I'm delighted to have uh, Michael here and to tell us his, his story. My cousin, Michael Perry. <laughs> Well, um, it's nice to be back in my hometown, uh, born and raised in, uh, in Toronto. And I'd like to thank the uh, Mars Innovation Team and uh, Senator Grafstein, my cousin, uh, for inviting me here today. My, my, my blood is thinned, definitely, since I moved to California. So I'd also like to thank um, the uh, organizers of this group for uh, making this conference in October rather than in January or February. As I recall from my youth, I, I don't like being here at that time of year. Um, what I'd like to um, talk about today is um, a little different from the other speakers. Uh, we've been hearing um, uh, a lot about um, high tech. We've been hearing uh, a little bit about clean tech. Um, medical devices, um, I'd like to uh, focus a little bit more on biopharmaceuticals and pharmaceuticals, um, what the trends are um, that are going on there, um, what's been happening in the general landscape, um, uh, what the, what's, what's driving, basically, um, the various trends, and that's basically the, the multinational pharmaceutical industry, what's going on there. Um, Unmet medical needs, um, those are really the opportunities that drive innovation. Um, some of this may seem, you know, intuitive um, and obvious, uh, but they're not necessarily um, intuitive. Um, you'll see as I go through the examples um, that we're, we're, we're facing a, a number of crises in the healthcare systems um, across the world, and uh, these need to be addressed, so there's a, a lot of opportunity. And then, uh, of course, venture capital, and uh, I'd like to use Bay City Capital, my company, as a, a model of what's been going on in venture capital. And then, um, as, uh, as John uh, was saying earlier, how venture capital is changing in this environment. Um, can you see the graph? No, you're not seeing the graph. That's, you're seeing a black box. <laughs> You're seeing another black box. Ooh. This is, uh, well, there's one graph. Well, let me just tell you. There's a, a <laughs> are you able to uh, fix the slides by any chance? They're working on it. So let me, let me talk while they're working on the slides. Um, just consider this thought. Uh, where was medicine in 1950 um, compared to where the state, the art of medicine is today in 2010. Uh, we have discovered a lot of things. We have, we have, we have new medicines. Um, things have moved exponentially. Uh, but if one looks at that black box, what's supposed to be in there is a graph. And you'll see a graph that shows that the approval of new molecular entities or drugs or biologics has really not changed in so far as the number of new molecular entities that are being approved. Mm -hmm.